my video because uh, I am the one who is having issues today for uh, internet. But uh, oh. I turn off after my. So, Valid, are you ready? We are recording now. Yes, yes. Assalamu alaikum, good morning, and welcome to the 18th session of HIV Awareness, Prevention, and Education Project in Pakistan, designed and led by APNA Merit HIV Committee. This project aims to reduce HIV stigma, increase HIV awareness, and increase knowledge about the disease among the healthcare providers in Pakistan. With a using educational and research tools. Please note, this is a volunteer academic activity. Our main purpose is to open dialogue with key partners who are participating or responsible for implementing HIV care programs in Pakistan. Create ourselves with any political party. All views expressed in these webinars are speakers on personal views and do not reflect any institution. Our approach is forward looking and we are hoping to get constructive feedback from all of our participants. Please write all your questions in the question answer box and we will try to answer as many as we can. So our moderators today are Dr. Bushra Jameel and Dr. Fazia Kamar. Dr. Fazia Kamar, is a faculty member at UMass Medical School, Massachusetts, USA. She is a dual board certified inter in internal medicine and infectious diseases. She has been among the frontline healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. And she has volunteered her time by pro providing educational webinars to local community during the pandemic. In, a, in addition, she has been serving as a public health officer at the District Medical Society. Dr. Busha Jamil is a professor and ID specialist at Aga Khan University, Karachi, Pakistan. She is also the president of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases Society of Pakistan. Currently, she is taking lead in adopting our build capacity, adopt an ART center project in Pakistan. And the main aim of that project is to build capacity of HIV services in Pakistan. Thank you, Dr. Bushra and uh, Dr. Fazia for moderating today. And thank you everyone for joining us today. So here you go, Dr. Fazia. Or Bushra, sorry. I think it's Bushra's turn. Um, can I share my screen? Yes. So hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this very interesting webinar today. Um, I'm going to show you a few slides just to give you my assessment of the current situation in Pakistan uh, regarding IV drug use and uh, uh, the situation of HIV and how it is spreading. I don't see share screen button here somehow. Malik, can you please help? Green button. Usha, are you using a phone or computer? No, no, no. It's my laptop. You can click on the bottom of the share screen. You can click on the green color. You can click on it. Where you can see chat, participants, polls, uh, uh, maybe please share screen. So you are a co-host today. The other thing is you can go to set. Send them to the lead and he can share, or I can share too now. Gee, please, if you can share the presentation. Okay, let's see. I don't have share screen option. So do I have your presentation? Uh, I sent it to you. Yeah. I emailed it to you. Yes, done. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the 
IBBS, which is the Integrated Biological and Behavioral Surveillance Survey, which have been conducted in Pakistan periodically to look at uh, HIV patterns and prevalence in the country. So the latest one uh, uh, was conducted in 2016-2017. And one of the key findings of that survey was a disappointing uh, statement that the program is lagging behind. And I'm going to show it, show you uh, the statement uh, which they've mentioned as their key finding. So Pakistan is faced with many problems, not the least of which is that Pakistan happens to be located within the golden crescent of opiate production. So heroin is produced uh, in large quantities and uh, Afghanistan, the neighboring country, is the biggest producer of heroin in the world. And uh, Pakistan is one route through which heroin is transported to other countries or smuggled out. So uh, we're going to, yeah. Uh, if you can go back to the first slide. So, so uh, that is one issue. The second one is, uh, yes, this is the statement from IBBS 2016-17, Fragmented HIV Prevention System in Pakistan, which has been, which has regressed actually and has been affected adversely because of political developments, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Next one, please. So besides this issue of opiate production, which I'm going to touch upon again, uh, it is important to note that the key drivers of HIV epidemic in Pakistan have been starting from the beginning, early 90s, the immigrants who acquired it from other countries and then brought it back to Pakistan, uh, those who inject drugs, sex workers, and the bridging population. Then uh, additional unique factors which, which are still true uh, in the current situation is the spread of infection through use of contaminated sharps, razors, and syringes. So barber shops were identified early on uh, during the outbreaks of HIV in different cities and uh, cities of Pakistan. And then came this issue of reuse of single-use syringes by general practitioners and quacks and health facilities, which because of poor infection prevention and control practices and inappropriate improper waste disposal uh, allowed people to scavenge through the waste and pick out the syringes and sell them again. And then uh, combined with the issue of co-infection with hepatitis B and C, that has put an average member of general population also at risk of acquiring HIV, as well as people who inject drugs. And then came the 18th Amendment with devolution of power, which meant that there was lack of national coordination, data analysis, and utilization at a national level non-availability of national guidance and monitoring uh, with a negative impact on the results of surveillance because all the numbers progressed instead of regressing. Next one, please. Next slide. Please. So this is the Golden Crescent I was talking about. And Karachi uh, is at the nexus of global drug trade routes and is one of the world's top cities registering a rise in HIV prevalence. So drug production and drug trafficking go hand in hand with HIV prevalence. Uh, combined with rudimentary rehabilitation systems and um, the decision whether to allow opiate substitution therapy uh, rests on uh, non-scientific entities. So this is not in the hands of subject experts or in the, for the, those who actually know what to do and how to control the disease. Next one, please. So uh, we have now uh, around 2 million people uh, living with HIV. 91% uh, live in the big provinces of Punjab and Sin. Highest proportion of cases are seen amongst people who inject drugs, followed by MSMs. And um, disease progression trends show escalating epidemic in 
uh, KP with faster rate among sexual networks, especially MSM and sex workers. So uh, prevention and testing program coverage in KPK remains amongst the lowest in Asia Pacific region. So in Pakistan, although the highest population of HIV uh, affected people uh, resides in Punjab and Sindh, but KP is going to catch up because of poor coverage and uh, uh, screening. Next one, please. So this is just a diagram, again, from IBBS 2016, which shows you that people who inject drug are in the center of the problem, uh, and they interact with MSMs, transgenders, female sex workers. So there is an interaction going on, followed by their interactions with the bridging population and then uh, eventual spillover in the population. So if you compare the two rounds of IBBS, in 2011, 37.8% of IV drug users were HIV positive, and this percentage increased in 2016. IBBS uh, uh, has not been conducted after 2016. Next one, please. So in response to a high prevalence of hepatitis, actually it was since Provincial Assembly uh, which put a ban on use of disposable syringes. And uh, this legislation was lauded and welcomed, but it was never implemented. And this was way back in 2011 when this uh, regulation uh, came out. Next one, please. Following this um, uh, outbreak of Ratodero, uh, the federal government came into action. And eventually, in February uh, 2022, uh, the government announced that they are putting a ban on disposable syringes and uh, the conventional disposable syringes will no longer be available and they will be replaced with auto disabled syringes across the country. Now, again, it's, um, it was a, actually a difficult decision even to come to this, but uh, the auto uh, disabled syringes are expensive and actually never found a place in our systems. Uh, secondly, uh, Malika will tell you that the IV drug users have tremendous amount of difficulty using auto disabled syringes because uh, they tend to push and pull the plunger while injecting drugs. So this is not an option for them. And then cost being a major factor, this, this strategy was never adopted and I don't know where it stands now. Next one, please. So what are the factors which have prevented implementation? This is one major question which we need to answer after today's uh, presentations and in today's discussion. So just go on clicking because this is an animated slide too. So one major reason which I think is important is failure to address reasons of reuse of syringes. Next one, please. So it is easy to uh, announce a re regulation or legislation, but if you don't address or understand the reasons of reuse, uh, your legislation, legislation is bound to fail. Cost, I've already talked about. Next one, please. Then people are poor, and if they have to pay out of pocket, they will opt for a cheaper syringe rather than an expensive one. Then, combined with illiteracy, they do not understand the magnitude of the problem. Next one, please. And neither do the GPs or the quacks. Quacks obviously do not understand. Even the GPs do not understand the seriousness of um, not observing the proper precautions while uh, using parental treatment. Then, weak regulation and probably complicity of regulators with practitioners. So, a number of clinics were shut down because they were non-compliant or using single use, reusing single use syringes, but th those clinics were later on allowed to open up again and practice, restart their practice. Then um, there, is, there has been a lack of local or indigenous ownership. For instance, the example of uh, Ratto Dero is a typical one in 2019, because all the international experts just descended on Larkana. They had long meetings, they formulated guidelines and policies, and then uh, they went back to their own countries. Um, and there has been a similar approach in other outbreaks, and there was very little buy-in 
or discussions with the local community. So this may have played a role in why the strategies which were proposed were never fully adopted or owned by the local people. Next one, please. So the important point to ponder or think about and discuss is that we've been taking stock of the situation and we do that in detail every few years and we've been doing it for the last 20 years. And whenever we encounter an increased number of cases, anywhere a hotspot, we call it an outbreak and just deal with it as if it's a first one. Then regarding IBBS, the surveillance system, who are the people who design it? Who conducts it? Um, are these people planners, policy makers, implementers? We do not know. There is a lot of political influence uh, in who gets to be on the group which designs IBBS. Then reuse of syringes and unsafe transfusion are still a reality. So GPs are deliberately opting to use syringes on multiple patients to save cost, even if uh, uh, auto-disabled syringe is introduced. Uh, GPs have already made their plans of using it on three or four patients in one go before discarding the syringe. Uh, um, then the cost, the syringes are expensive. They cannot be used by PWIDs. Then illiteracy, gender discrimination, poor healthcare systems, health-seeking behavior all need to be um, focused on, discussed, thought about. And lastly, absolute reliance on external funding to control HIV in Pakistan. So for TB, HIV, and malaria, I'm not aware of any indigenous funding. There may be some provincial funding, but at federal level, there was no money for uh, funding any of the disease control programs in the country. So there is almost total reliance on external funding. Next one, please. So thank you very much. Uh, with this, I would like to introduce our two speakers for today. Next one, please. Next. Uh, just a minute. The one after this. So our first speaker is going to be uh, Ms. Malika Zafar. She's the executive director ah, of an NGO. Busha, Busha, sorry, G can I interrupt you here? G -G 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 -G. I think first, uh, Fazia will introduce Dr. Rich. And okay, okay, will... okay, fine. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, yeah, let's, um, um, our next, um, Thank you so much, uh, Bushra, for fantastic insights on uh, what is the current situation in Pakistan. Um, we will move forward with uh, our next um, speaker, um, Dr. Josiah Rich, who is a professor of medicine and epidemiology at uh, Brown University since 1994. Um, he is a NIH-funded researcher for over 25 years. Um, he is a public health educate, and he is focused on the overlap between addiction and infectious diseases, especially among disadvantaged populations. Um, we uh, really appreciate uh, Dr. Rich, you joining us today and uh, um, telling us a little um, story and your insights on how you ran these programs from the beginning, as we can see that uh, Pakistan is struggling and probably we can learn a lot of lessons. Um, which might be slightly different because I think cost, community acceptance and illiteracy were not such big issues in United States, but let's see what you have to say and then we'll move forward from there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. And, and uh, thank you, Fiza, for, uh, uh, and, and, and the rest of the organizers for uh, this wonderful opportunity. Um, I uh, just like to say salam and uh, I, I've, feel uh, close to Pakistan. I, I only visited East Pakistan uh, when I was during my training. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, FISA has for, for over 20 years has uh, kept me updated and, uh, and uh, I really felt um, uh, saddened to hear about the uh, uh, syringe related outbreak and, uh, and uh, always hoping that there's something I could do to help uh, with HIV in Pakistan. This 
Um, so I'm yeah, going to tell a story about my own journey, but it, it's just hearing this presentation um, really highlighted several of the key overlaps in, in similar issues. So back in 1994, we had this crisis. Uh, I think 50,000 Americans died that year from AIDS. Um, and uh, it was the worst epidemic in uh, several generations uh, in the United States. Um, and of course, predominantly was uh, men having sex with men. But in Rhode Island, when I arrived, uh, it was actually a predominantly injection drug use epidemic. And um, the issue of scarcity of syringes that was you know, present in 2019 and, and came to light uh, is actually the same issue, well, a related issue in Rhode Island. Because when I would ask patients um, why, uh, what, what they did in terms of drug use, they would tell me that they uh, would use the same syringe that somebody else had just used. And I would say, well, why would you do that? And they said, well, because they were desperate to, they were in withdrawal, they needed the, 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 you know, the drug, they needed heroin right away. And they, um, they uh, uh, didn't have another syringe. So there was a scarcity of syringes. So they would just reuse, even if it just came out of their, their, uh, their partner's arm. Uh, they would use it. And I usually would have this discussion in the setting of doing an HIV test. And they would look at me horrified, almost as if they had seen themselves do something on a video that they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to believe that they had done, but they knew they did it because now they're getting HIV tested. And oh my goodness, what have I done? So <clears throat> when I asked them, well, why isn't there a syringe? Because of course, I've spent my whole career working in the medical setting and there's plenty of syringes. They said, you can't get them. And I said, why not? And it turns out Rhode Island in its wisdom had passed a law, a felony offense. It's a serious offense, uh, you know, jail time for possession of a single syringe. The punishment was five years imprisonment. If you just had one syringe without a prescription. So, you know, there is this sort of cat and mouse game between the, uh, the people who use drugs and the police. And the focus was on that syringe, because at the time, possession of heroin was only three years of, of imprisonment. And a little complicated to arrest someone for heroin because you had to prove it was heroin. So you'd have to, if you were the arresting officer, you'd have to send the heroin to the lab. It would take a few months to come back. It was cumbersome. If you get somebody with a syringe, you can squeeze them, which is what their game is. They get the small fish and then they squeeze them. And then, you know, who did you buy this from? And then, you know, we're gonna really, you know, lock you away for a long time unless you tell us. And then they work their way up. So that's their strategy. And a lot of it was focused on the syringe. So a result, as a result, people who were using drugs learned very quickly to not carry syringes. So they would go someplace, buy their, buy their drug, there would be a syringe there. They would use the syringe and then they didn't want to carry it. So they would leave it there and the next person would come along and do the same thing. So it was almost, uh, you know, designed to transmit HIV and other bloodborne pathogens. So Rhode Island at the time was one of only four states with more than half of the AIDS cases related to injection drug use. Now, we already knew at that point that needle exchange programs were uh, uh, effective, um, and they're effective for a number of reasons. Uh, one is simply to just provide syringes so that people wouldn't have to use um, someone else's syringe. Uh, but the other uh, is they, uh, they provide um, a human connection the people working in needle exchange programs are full of compassion and caring and empathy. And, you know, somebody who is using a drug in our society, our society, if you say drug user, people image criminal. We have had this so-called war on drugs for, um, you know, uh, uh, more, more than a generation, generations. And, uh, we have, um, you know, portrayed people who use drugs as bad people in the media, 
and you know we have this sort of fascination with uh, incarceration in our society and and so um you know people uh, I, I mean people get treated very poorly if they have uh if they have addiction to a drug uh certain drugs if they're addicted to alcohol oh well that's just alcohol we uh, that's the american way if it's nicotine oh well of course you have to smoke like everybody has to smoke otherwise how can the tobacco companies make all their profits um but uh but if it's heroin the you're you know you're you've crossed the line you're a bad person and you know we can do all kinds of terrible things to you not give you health care not treat you with compassion not uh, and and so people learn that if they tell their employer they're going to get fired if they tell their neighbors they're going to get shunned if they tell their family they're going to be ostracized uh, if they tell their landlord, they're going to lose their housing. So people have learned that you keep this hidden if you can. You don't tell your healthcare providers uh, because bad things will happen. You'll get treated very differently. Um, so um, <laughs> the uh, increase in spread of HIV in Rhode Island was really driven by this law. So we First thing, we set up a needle exchange program. That was helpful. Um, uh, but then I knew we needed to change the law. So we uh, we got a bunch of students and we put white coats on them and we all marched down to the state capitol and we, uh, and we were able to pass a bill, a compromised bill that got rid of the felony offense, but had it just a, uh, a, uh, a misdemeanor, like a traffic ticket. So you wouldn't go to jail for it. But the problem there was it didn't allow the pharmacists to sell the syringes. So we had to go back uh, a couple of years later and, uh, and then fully legalize syringes. Now, I told the, when I testified at the, at the state Congress, uh, I said, you know, here is a graph of uh, injection drug use related HIV in Rhode Island. This is slide one, by the way. And if, uh, if you pass this legislation, this is what will happen to HIV-related injection drug use. It will disappear because it, if we can get the pharmacists to, um, to uh, provide access to sterile syringes, people don't wanna get HIV. They're not going out there trying to get HIV. They need to be educated that you shouldn't share syringes or the other things you use. Now, I just wanna, um, digress for a moment about HIV transmission through syringes. If you um, have an HIV virus and you put it on the desk and it dries, by the time it's dried, it's no longer contagious. So if you have a syringe and you have uh, somebody with HIV uses it, um, they when they take it out of their arm in a few, you know, in a few minutes, the outside surface will dry off and the HIV on the outside of the syringe will be, um, will be no longer viable and, and you won't be able to get HIV from that. So, I mean, if you take it right out and, and use it, that could be a problem, but the outside uh, wouldn't be such a problem. I got I got called to the emergency room one day. Uh, there was a panicked parents of a young boy who was six or seven years old. He was playing with his friend in the playground in this little sandbox and they found a syringe there. And they said, oh, let's play doctor here. Let me give you a shot. And the one boy poked the other boy. And the boy who got poked with the syringe his parents were terrified. They brought him in. Oh my God, he has HIV. He has something else. What do we do? Um, and that boy was fine. He didn't get HIV. He was never going to get HIV because the only part that exposed him was the part on the outside of that uh, needle. And that any HIV, if the thing had been sitting for any time in the sandbox, was dried up and was gone. He might have had a bacterial infection or something else. But he wasn't going to get HIV from that. Now, contrast that image of an injection from, uh, you know, uh, from, well, so for one example is somebody's giving shots, like uh, um, 
we had um, we had a fear that there were uh, people who used uh, testosterone-like compounds, steroids, to build up their muscles. And so these would be weightlifters that work, you know, that would uh, be working in, working out in the gym, and they would pool their money and say they would buy one vial of this expensive stuff, and they would get one syringe, and they would all, you know, drop their trousers in a row, and somebody would go down and uh, inject the, each bottom with the with it with the same syringe, and that's you know that's horrible. And you'd think that oh boy, if somebody had HIV, yeah, that could spread it as well. It's not as efficient because when you think about it, that syringe is generally going into a muscle, which doesn't have a lot of blood in it. It has some, but it's not like it's going into a vein. Now, um, it's, it's possible, you know, right from one to the next to spread it. But when somebody is injecting because they want to get that heroin into the site of action in their brain, they don't want to inject it into the muscle. They don't want to inject it under the skin. They want to get it right into the vein. So when they stick the needle into their vein, you know, they can see the vein. Oftentimes they'll use a tourniquet. Uh, and then when they stick it in, what, then the, reason, the, the way they know that it's in is they pull back on the syringe. And then you see some blood coming into the syringe. So therefore, you know that you're in. And then you inject it. And then oftentimes they'll pull back and forth again to, you know, they worked long and hard for that, uh, to get that drug and they want to get every single trace of it into their body. So they flush it back and forth. So then when they pull it out, they have a syringe that has been flushed on the inside once and maybe several times with blood. Now, imagine inside that the barrel of that syringe, there's a little corner right near where this needle comes out and there's a little drop of blood in there. Uh, well, the surface of that drop of blood is gonna dry off at some rate and the HIV on the surface is gonna die. But that moist area in the inside of the drop, that can stay moist for a long time, uh, especially inside a syringe and that can have viable virus. Uh, studies have shown that they, the virus can last for months inside a syringe. So even if you took that syringe, the little kid in the playground and just poked somebody, the outside of the needle is not gonna have it. But, the in, but if that boy took it and put it into a vein and flushed it back and forth, that would be a different story. And so that's what happens when people inject drugs. Um, now, the situation with healthcare workers reusing syringes is sort of somewhere in between. If they're injecting it into the vein, that's a higher risk than if they're just injecting into the muscle. If they're injecting it into the muscle right away, um, they, you know, there there could be viable virus even on the outside of the of the needle, uh, but much less. There was, you know, there was this report, I think, twenty years ago, in in uh, of an old doctor who had, you know, it was injecting people, and he would use the same syringe, he would inject someone and then he would have a little alcohol wipe and he would wipe the syringe and he'd drop some more and he would inject somebody else. And everybody was outraged that how could this doctor do it? And he ended up losing his license and everything. But from a pragmatic standpoint, that was, you know, probably he didn't, he probably didn't transmit anything because he was wiping the outside every time and he was just giving intramuscular uh, injections. But uh, we wouldn't recommend that. So, okay, so what happened in Rhode Island is we went ahead and passed that law to legalize syringes. Um, at the same time, we went and educated every single pharmacist in Rhode Island to say, when you're giving someone a syringe, you're not telling them to go and inject drugs. Because in Rhode Island at the time, we had an estimated 10, 10 to 20,000 people who are injecting drugs we had 50,000 diabetics and we're a small state. We only have a population of a million, but you know, there was, I never met anybody who couldn't get a syringe. Everybody had access to a syringe. It's just a question of whether it's a used syringe or a sterile brand new syringe. So we educated the pharmacist that when you're giving someone a syringe or selling them a syringe, you're not telling them to go and inject drugs. They don't need to be told that they're already injecting drugs. There, you're telling them to be safe, use this to protect yourself and to protect the people around you. 
And the pharmacists were great. They got that message uh, and they and they distributed syringes. And that slide that I predicted that injection drug use in Rhode Island related HIV would disappear was exactly accurate. Uh, the uh, injecting HIV disappeared until more recently when we've hit with this uh, new opioid uh, epidemic uh, that is still hammering us today. Um, now, in Rhode Island, we have, uh, heroin has been a predominant um, a drug of injection. Um, and we uh, also have a lot of cocaine stimulant and then more recently methamphetamine injection. Um, but <laughs> opioid use disorder, heroin addiction is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's unique among addictions because of the properties, the two fundamental properties of opioids. Uh, one is the um, tolerance that people get. If you inject or use an opiate on a daily basis, within days to weeks, you will develop tolerance. Tolerance means that the dose that you took at first doesn't provide the same effect after time. You need to go to a higher dose and you need to go to a higher dose and a higher dose. The more you use, the more you need to use. And it seems like tolerance, the sky's the limit. Now, the second physiologic effect is once you've developed tolerance, if you stop abruptly, you go into withdrawal. Now, people have described withdrawal as feeling like you are dying. You uh, imagine the worst stomach bug you ever had. You have diarrhea, you're vomiting, you're feeling dehydrated and washed out. And then imagine the worst flu you ever had. Your head is pounding, you're coughing, your, your body's aching. Add those two together and multiply it by a thousand. That's what it feels like to go through withdrawal. People literally feel like they're dying. And when somebody's dying, you know, we, we have this cerebral cortex. We think we use our, that we're in charge. You know, we are thinking uh, beings. Um, and so, you know, that's the way, and we're, we've got some arrogance. So uh, I'm in charge. I tell my arm to go up, it goes up. I tell it to go down, it goes down. I'm in charge. Tell myself I hold my breath. <laughs> I hold my breath. I'm in charge. But after a couple of minutes, my primitive brain says, you know what? We're taking over here. Get out of the driver's seat. I'm driving and you're going to breathe. And I don't care if there's a smoke-filled room or if you're underwater. You, it's impossible to hold your breath till you die because your primitive brain kicks in and says, we need this for our survival. And that's what happens when someone gets desperate and they're in withdrawal. They feel like they're dying. The primitive brain kicks in and they will do whatever they need to do. The most awful things they will do. They will sell their grandmother. They will do whatever they need to do to get that opiate. Now, the problem with this disease is that is really that withdrawal. Patients tell me, you know, when you first take it, like if this is normal, this is feeling normal. If you first take it, you get a little high feeling. You can feel it, it, you know, opiates relieve pain. They relieve physical pain. They relieve psychological pain. So if your pain gets relieved, that's great. But then it comes back down, it wears off. And then you take another dose and you go up. And then eventually you start developing this tolerance. So you you take a dose, you don't go quite as high as you used to, and then you start going into withdrawal, and then you're not normal, you're below normal, you're in withdrawal. And then you take a dose, but you know because your tolerance is going up, the amount that you're taking has gone up, but pretty soon you can't buy enough. So then you're down um, in withdrawal, and you just take enough to just get up to feeling normal. And patients tell me that all the time, say, doc, I don't even get high anymore. I just want to feel normal. Um, and they're spending most of their life in withdrawal and, and it's, and it's hell, it's misery. And, and it's, a, it's an awful life. Um, but they're stuck because they have such tolerance. And if they try and stop, they go into severe withdrawal. Uh, it's like a boa constrictor. It, you know, wraps around you and tightens. And every time you breathe out, it tightens and you, you can't breathe in. So that's, that's the disease. I'm, 
I'm quite curious to see if there's um, if there's uh, treatment that the treatment for opioid use disorder in the U.S. is uh, medication based. That is the most effective treatment that we have. There's three medications available in the U.S. Methadone, which has been around the longest, is a pure opiate agonist, um, and I have to say. All three of these medicines work by the same, that ultimately by the same effect, but by different, slightly different mechanisms. But the effect is they block uh, uh, additional heroin or additional opiate use. So if you are on methadone, you're taking a, a pill or a liquid every day, and if you try and take heroin on top of that, you won't feel it because the methadone is on the receptor binding it. Um, the, um, the second most uh, 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 widely used in the US is buprenorphine. The trade name is Suboxone. That can be either a strip or a pill that you dissolve under your tongue, uh, usually once a day, maybe several times a day. It can also be available as a patch or as an injection, weekly or monthly injection. Um, and that um, is a mixed agonist and an antagonist. So you get a little bit of stimulation of the receptor, but you also get it blocked. And then there's naltrexone, which is a monthly injection that is a complete blocker. So they all block the effects of any additional opiates and they end up you know, pre preventing that behavior. Um, so I, uh, I, I, perhaps I'll stop there. I think I've talked for uh, uh, quite a while. Um, and if there's, um, uh, uh, hopefully we can have a discussion and, and other issues will come up. Um, but I think, you know, the, well, I didn't actually touch on uh, incarceration uh, because of course we are incarceration crazy in the US. So anybody who uses drugs, good chance they'll get incarcerated. Uh, and at one point we had, uh, we set up an HIV testing in our correctional facility, which is a combined prison and jail. And, and during the 1990s, we identified a third of the people in the state with HIV. That's a pretty big slice of the pie. Uh, when you think of the whole pie of people in the state with, with HIV, a third were diagnosed at the Department of Corrections. So we developed a model program to, you know, diagnose them, get them educated about the disease, get their partners tested, get them started on treatment, get them linked to treatment when they get out. Uh, and FISA has been very helpful with that program. And, um, and then, uh, you know, that whole time, what we didn't realize, we had hoped, but by getting those people into treatment, we have actually uh, made a huge impact on the epidemic, on the HIV epidemic, because if they're on treatment for their HIV, they're going to stop transmitting to other people. Uh, and those are people at very high risk for transmission to others. So that diagram that you saw earlier uh, in the talk about um, these people who inject drugs in the center with the sexual transmission spreading out from it, that is really, um, you know, aside from the importance of taking care of people with with this disease of, uh, of opioid use disorder or addiction, uh, getting them treated in an effective way is going to help everyone else not get HIV. So I think that's um, you know correctional facility in the U.S. is an excellent way to identify these people, uh, get them at a time when they can <laughs> be stabilized and and then and then transition them into ongoing care. So I'll, I'll stop there and I uh, love to be uh, uh, hear questions and then even beyond this talk, uh, I'm happy to uh, um, uh, entertain questions, thoughts, ideas, and, and any way I can help. You guys have a, uh, have a huge task ahead of you. Um, but I think you know, there's, there's globally, there is a fair amount of experience and, and uh, you know, the, the antiviral medications have never been as good. Uh, and I think attitudes towards addiction uh, are, uh, you know, evolving. And I don't know how, how things are there. I would point out that, you know, when methadone was approved in the 1960s, it was approved based on some very small, elegant studies 
randomizing people to methadone or not. And what they found pretty quickly was then people were on methadone, their chaotic, crazy lives normalized. But that wasn't really what convinced people to, you know, to, to convince them to get approved. They stopped dying. Opioid use disorder is a deadly disease. Um, and, um, you know, most people recover from it if they don't die. So uh, the deaths come from overdose, come from infection, come from violence. Um, but if you can get, um, <coughs> if you can get into recovery, uh, then you can move on. There's a strong genetic predisposition. There's also a strong trauma. I, I, I mentioned that uh, people who, um, uh, that, that, that opioids alleviate um, psychological pain. You know, a common story in the US is a, a, a young person, young woman or uh, a girl who uh, was, or, or boy, was sexually abused as a child. Uh, and then when they went to try and tell somebody in their family, they said, oh, no, no, he would never do that you're lying. Uh, and man, if he did do it, you know, it was probably your fault. And by the way, we don't talk about that in our family. So this poor child grows up having this psychological burden on their shoulders. And it's, you know, it's, it's weighing on their psyche day and night. Uh, and then finally, they get exposed to a little opioid. And that, that just comes off their chest, like, it's over there. It happened. I can acknowledge it's happened and I can move on. Now I'm finally free. And then the opiate wears off and it comes crushing back down. You know, in that situation, who wouldn't want to go back and get another opiate uh, and try it again? So, uh, and, and the things that people do, the desperate things creates so much trauma as well. So if you didn't have trauma before you got onto this disease, you certainly have plenty of trauma afterwards. And, you know, it's hard to, so, you know, addressing that trauma and understanding that and understanding that that's how, you know, a lot of people, uh, behavior is driven, uh, uh, leads to better understanding of this disease and hopefully better treatments and better outcomes. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to questions. Thank you, Dr. Rich. So, Bushra, now it's your turn. So, um, should we ask questions now or should we go ahead with the presentations first? I can go ahead with the presentation and we'll ask, the, we'll open for questions at the end. So, uh, it would be nice if I can have the slides I prepared for the presenters, but I can introduce them without the slides as well. So, our first speaker is going to be Ms. Malika Zafar. She's the, she's the executive director of an NGO called Nai Zindagi, uh, which focuses on uh, uh, injection drug users. And, uh, and Nai Zindagi happens to be the principal recipient uh, for HIV from the Global Fund Grant for Pakistan. Our second speaker uh, today is Dr. Sharaf Ali Shah. Uh, who was the first head of uh, Sindh AIDS Control Program when it was founded uh, way back in the 1990s. Um, and he, he is the executive director of Bridge Foundation, which is, again, an NGO, a not-for-profit organization, and a sub-recipient of Nai Zindagi. And Dr. Sharaf Shah has a vast experience of uh, dealing with uh, HIV-infected individuals and not just works with the, the injection drug users, but also with other marginalized populations. So over to you, Malika. Thank you very much, Dr. Bushra. Um, and I'm very grateful to be part of this conversation. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rich, for your compassionate and uh, informative talk. Um, I'm just going to put this one. Uh, so Nai Zindagi was established in 1989 by a group of people who were affected by drug use. Um, Nai Zindagi's main aim is to provide right-based uh, treatment and prevention 
for people who use drugs, inject drugs, and their partners and families. Um, our approach is um, outreach-based. Um, so we believe instead of having the clients come to you at a drop-in center, we should go out to them. So currently we're in 500 spots uh, in 58 districts in Pakistan, covering all four provinces. Um, here you can see a picture of our mobile, um, uh, sorry, of our um, outreach worker. So we have around 280 outreach workers who go every day to the spots and give a HIV prevention package, which includes uh, three syringes, three needles, uh, th three spirit swabs, uh, three bandages and condoms. And then we have mobile testing vans that go to these spots. They test clients voluntarily. Whoever is uh, positive, we link them to uh, the ART centers. In Pakistan, the ART centers are provincially uh, run by the government. Medication is provided by Global Fund, but um, we have to link them to the ART centers. Um, and a lot of the times, you know, they're very far, so it, it's challenging to take clients from the spots when they're in the midst of chaotic drug use uh, to uh, the ART centers. Um, then we also have an ART adherence unit. Uh, because there's no opioid substitution therapy, we came up with the um, innovation with our Dutch partner Mainline, um, because at that point, service providers were unwilling to link clients, uh, people who inject drugs to ART, uh, because they said that they are not going to continue treatment. Um, so we said, okay, you know, there's a place uh, we can, they can come get withdrawal management, and then we'll have doctors there to assist there. Um, initiation of ARVs. So that center is a three to six week residential um, care facility. Um, and obviously it's completely voluntary. So people can, oops. Did I lose the screen? Hello. Hello. We can hear you. Yeah. Sorry, I think, one second, sorry. Ma Malika, yes, actually... okay. Actually, we were not able to see your screen, so I just... Oh, got I'm so sorry. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, should I try it again? Yeah, or you can just tell me which sorry. slide to move on. I will just go there. Or you can try it again. You can share this again. I will stop sharing now. Okay. Is it sharing? Can you see it yep. now? Yes. yes. Now we can share. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. No problem. Here you go. Is it visible? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So this was the picture I was referring to about um, our outreach worker uh, and the HIV prevention packages. Um, then we have a spouse program. So those clients who are uh, positive, um, if they give us permission, we go to their houses. We have female outreach workers who go, uh, they test the spouses and the children, then link them to the ART centers, facilitate uh, travel to the ART centers and link them to PPTCT. Um, so I think there are very few ART centers um, and hospitals that offer PPTCT uh, to P women who um, have HIV. So uh, then we also link them to private um, hospitals where it's possible, but this is also very challenging. Um, then we collaborate with uh, various sectors. Um, so we have district AIDS councils where um, the DC is the chairperson and we have people from the police, the health department, um, and we have uh, quarterly or uh, sort of yearly meetings with them to um, raise awareness about HIV and tell them about our services. Uh, then we have a procurement, uh, a centralized procurement system. So everything is procured through tender RFQ. And then it is distributed to the various uh, COP uh, continuum of prevention care sites in 44 districts across Pakistan. Um, then we also have viral load testing. Um, before the ART centers were supposed to uh, do this, but we realized that we are not getting any information. Uh, about uh, the viral load and um, neither the clients. So again, we did a sort of a small intervention. Uh, so a small pilot with Mainline and now Global Fund has taken it over and we have uh, four gene expert machines that uh, go and do uh, the rounds. And um, so far this, uh, we've done 
6,000 something tests and uh, the viral suppression has been 65%, which in this key population is quite um, impressive, um, I think. Uh, then we have uh, well, in touch, uh, which is uh, we have four counselors who call um, the people who have been through the ART adherence unit to monitor to see if they have any issues in receiving ARVs. And if they do have any issues, they um, tell our program team and then we sort of try to uh, fix those. Then we also have a management information system where um, each client is given a unique identifier number. Um, ideally, it would be an ID card, but uh, in Pakistan, um, not in Pakistan, sorry, in this population, uh, people who inject drugs, uh, it's very rare that they have ID cards. About, I think, 10% of them maybe have ID cards. So we use their father's name and their name to sort of, uh, and their identifier number to um, register them. Um, and this is the AIT adherence unit, which... Um, is a three to six week residential facility where after they receive the medication from the ART centers, they come uh, to the ART adherence unit. And the first 10 days are withdrawal management. We have uh, residential doctors um, who also um, assist with the um, so, uh, withdrawal management and then any issues faced uh, with uh, the ARVs. We also offer psychosocial support. So we have psychologists and counselors uh, most of our counselors, there are people we, uh, who have been uh, on the streets injecting and have HIV and, uh, you know, have gone through our program. So we try to provide job opportunities for them. There was an independent study done by the Global Fund, which showed that those people who had been through the ART adherence unit were much more likely to adhere to ARVs. And this is our coverage. The green um, is where we have sites in Karachi, we have, um, and Sanghar Bridge is our partner. The light green is where we are covering, we don't have actual um, offices, but we are covering through mobile outreach. The plus is where we have the ART adherence unit, which is a residential facility, and the central warehouse is in Islamabad, where the PR office is also located. So um, this is our service delivery data from 2012 to 2022. Uh, we have two AT outreach workers making 7,500 contacts daily with people who inject uh, drugs and their spouses. We distribute around 22,000 syringes at 500 hotspots all across Pakistan. Uh, we provide antiseptic. Sorry, we provide antiseptic dressing and basic basic medical care to around 3,000 people who inject drugs. Uh, we reach over 24,000 uh, period and spouses with testing and counseling services in a year. And we facilitate the provision of over 6,000 um, uh, ARVs to PVID and their spouses through the ART centers in the public sector. Oops, sorry. Uh, so this is... Uh, we started our uh, services in the jails also in September 2021. Uh, we met with the IG prisons and uh, we did a small survey in Malid prison, which has the highest population of people who use drugs. Uh, then based on that survey, we <laughs> developed an intervention supported by the Global Fund. Um, and uh, so in Malid prison and in central prison in Karachi, because the numbers are high, we have two HTC counselors, one social mobilizer slash paramedic, and one data entry operator. In the rest of Sindh, we are covering um, the jail, uh, the testing and the treat uh, linkages to treatment through our existing COPC sites. And um, the women's prisons, the testing is quite low because the numbers are also very low. Um, and uh, we uh, wanted, we thought we would move to Punjab and. KPK and Balochistan, but um, we're currently under negotiation and um, Punjab, uh, I mean, Punjab says that they have uh, excellent uh, programs running, which we are not aware of, but uh, hopefully, you know, um, we will move into other provinces also. So the challenges we are facing is absence of opioid substitution therapy and drug treatment services. Um, all rehabilitation centers in Pakistan are involuntary. 
um so uh, that's you know basic human rights violation um and as far as i'm aware there is no rehabilitation center that actually understands um addiction um or substance abuse disorder so that's quite sad then there's a constant stigma discrimination faced by our clients when they go to the art centers you know by the society at large by healthcare providers um criminalization you know small amounts of uh, drugs people are in jail for um then there's a current ban on conventional syringes the dr bushra was mentioning um luckily we procured syringes till 2000 the end of 2023 but moving forward it's unlikely that we will be able to uh procure them because there's a very very strict uh, ban uh on import and manufacturing uh so this is something that uh we have requested the stakeholders to um you know sort of raise a voice about but they're still silent um at one point we did speak to the health minister and um there was a summary that was passed but then it got lost so uh this is a challenge for us um then long distances to art centers um is a barrier in linking and retaining clients on art uh so we had proposed a mobile um art service delivery where we'd have doctors trained by aga khan and for refills we would be going to the spots where clients are so that you know because a lot of the times they don't want to leave um and because their lifestyle is so chaotic you know they either withdrawing or uh, chasing the drug or you know trying to find money so they within that cycle arvs is the least of uh, their concerns um so we proposed that however um that was rejected by the government as they view themselves to be the custodians of uh, arvs which is really unfortunate because we are losing lives um, based on this and uh, it could significantly improve uh, ai t retention um in people who inject drugs uh, then also there's a high burden of hepatitis c among people with pakistan has around a, i think a 7% um prevalence of hepatitis c amongst the general population and obviously in people who inject drugs it's much much higher um the clients who have come to the art uh, adherence unit we have um, their baseline so th in the rapid test um, i think around at least 98% of them do come positive um so currently we have requested global fund for um uh, treatment for um, some people who inject drugs and hopefully uh with uh, dr bushra we will move ahead with this intervention but again um for the next grant and for the next global fund grant we hope to get a uh significant uh, budget for pwid with hep c and um that's all thank you so much open to any questions thank you thank you very much that was a very nice presentation of the work uh, nice and the is doing uh, in the country i would now request dr sharaf ali shah to uh, tell us about his work and the role of bridge foundation and their contribution in trying to curtail hiv epidemic in pakistan thank you dr bushra and i'm uh, grateful to apna marriage for providing this opportunity and we really appreciate the work of uh, apna marriage in prevention and control of hiv aids in pakistan so we have here the two major public health problems number one is the injecting drug use which is driving hiv epidemic among people who inject drugs and second issue is unsafe therapeutic injection practices and which is uh, threat of rapid spread of uh, hiv in general population and we have already we already know that hepatitis b and hepatitis c problems of pakistan linked to the unsafe injection practices and moreover the recent hiv outbreak which was reported 
from uh, Ratudeh Road District Larkana, in which uh, uh, majority of children were reported with a child infection was linked to the unsafe injection practices. Okay, can I see my slides? Hello? Dr. Bushra? Well, so you want us to share the slides? Okay. Can you hear me? Sure, give can me one minute. Slides? Okay, then I can continue. So to understand uh, PWIDs in Pakistan, uh, it's a visible population in all, almost all major cities of uh, Pakistan, and they can be easily recognized by their uh, appearance. Mostly, they are homeless, live on the streets, and uh, rejected by their families, and overwhelming majority is uh, males. Mostly, they are males and young people and unemployed, they are jobless and uh, earn their living to begging and have very limited uh, access to the healthcare services and social services. And unfortunately, the general population uh, has uh, le remains least concerned about uh, this very visible population. Harm reduction program in Pakistan is being implemented at, as uh, Malika said, in 58 districts of Pakistan. And we have about 169 districts in the country. And Pakistan introduced the needle exchange program in 2003 and 2004. But there are a lot of issues with the harm reduction program. So I will discuss the issues, the major issues. Number one is the next, please. Next. Next. So issues are the low coverage, about 36% of PWIDs, according to WHO, get services of, of harm reduction program. Pakistan is the only country in Asia that doesn't have OST, that is opioid substitution therapy program. And then there's no needle and syringe exchange program in prisons. Although, according to the estimates, 40% of the prison population in Pakistan use drugs, and significant number of uh, these people use injecting drugs. And there's no rehabilitation program in public sector for PWI at provincial level. Provincial are, 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 are federal level. Although anti-narcotic force, that's called ANF, has established model addicts treatment centers, but they don't entertain the HIV positive or even hepatitis B, C positive PWIDs are the drug users. Unsafe injection practices is again very big issue in Pakistan. And recent HIV outbreak in children reported from Ratudero 2019 was linked to unsafe injection practices. And there are three issues here. Unnecessary use of injection, which is very common. And uh, unnecessary injections are given not only by the informal sector, but even the formal care providers qualified people also give the unnecessary injection. Reuse of syringes is again serious problem. Then safe disposal of the used syringes and other hazardous material is also a very serious problem in this country. We don't have incidental facilities at primary healthcare facilities and even in the public sector health facilities. And general practitioner, mostly they don't have any proper disposal of used 
syringes. So they mostly dispose of used syringes in the garbage dumps. National action plan was the, for the safety, injection safety was launched by the federal government of Pakistan, Ministry of National Health Services, with support of WHO in 2019. And it had three major components, regulation, creation of enabling environment, and community empowerment. And provincial assemblies pass bills to promote auto-disabled syringes that already been discussed, but there has been no implementation on these both fronts. So way forward is that we have to promote political commitment to increase the coverage of uh, injecting drug users and to promote uh, auto-disabled syringes and to discourage the unnecessary use of injections. And then OST program in the country, that is must. And I will ask also this question from the speaker. How is it possible to implement harm reduction program without OST or without even rehabilitate comprehensive health safety rehabilitation program? And then we have a lot of uh, issues with the needle and syringe exchange program in, in the general public, and there's no program in the prisons. It's very difficult to convince general public, even government officials about the needle and syringe exchange program because mostly they they think that perhaps needle and syringe exchange program is to promote the drug use rather than prevent the drug use. So it's very big issue in Pakistan. Mostly public doesn't accept it. We don't have detox program and rehabilitation programs, and mostly these drug users, recovering drug, drug users who undergo the this uh, re uh, detox, they again relapse, and relapse rest in Pakistan is almost 100%. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Fozia. Thank you so much, Dr. Rich, Dr. Sharpali Shah, uh, Malika Zafar. Um, very informative session indeed. Um, in summary, I would say that, you know, there's been now nearly 30 years of research, which has shown that comprehensive um, syringe programs are safe, effective, cost saving. They do not increase illegal drug use or crime contrary to what the critics say about these programs. And they play an important role in reducing the transmission of blood-borne pathogens like uh, viral hepatitis, HIV, and other infections. Um, we do have uh, great studies, um, especially the one which was like a landmark study, Journal of Substance Abuse Treatment in 2000, which showed that um, new users of uh, syringe programs, the safe syringe programs are five times more likely to enter the drug treatment and about three times more likely to stop using drugs uh, than those who don't use these programs. And I um, kind of like uh, keep hearing this from both Malika as well as Dr. Sharif, uh, the, the issues about um, not having the good rehab programs and detox centers. So my uh, question to both of you, and I guess for um, Malika first is like, uh, Naizindig is doing an amazing work, but are there any like counselors, addiction specialists, uh, psychiatrists who are affiliated with Naizindig who would provide like kind of a, um, you know, a counseling session to these patients at the time of like dispensing of these uh, safe needles to them to um, help them understand the importance of entering uh, a rehab or a detox center? Because, you know, this is of course, like uh, not something which, which can be forced on anyone. Malika, do you have anything to say um, and give us some information on this? Uh, yes. Uh, so actually, if whenever uh, I visited uh, the spots or if anybody visits, actually, the first thing that those people who don't have HIV 
ask for is drug treatment because they say to us that, oh, you're giving it to those people who have HIV, but what about us? And um, unfortunately, we don't. Global Fund, uh, the only reason we have the ART adherence units is because of the ARVs. Uh, otherwise, Global Fund doesn't fund um, uh, rehabilitation. It's not seen as a, a viable option for HIV um, uh, reduction. I'm sorry, sorry for um, you know reducing transmission. Um, and ideally, the government would have rehabilitation centers or support programs like this, uh, but uh, the government uh, does not do that. ANF also, the, re the rehabilitation centers are more lockups and the measures they use um, for treatment may not be uh, up to date with the latest practices. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that the people at the spots are very aware of uh, wanting treatment, mm -hmm. but uh, options are limited um, due to funding. Otherwise, if we had funding, because Naizindagi started off as a uh, rehab, at, you know, the first right-based rehabilitation center in Pakistan and slowly evolved. And um, so, sort of now we are doing primarily HIV prevention and treatment. Um, so yeah, so basically funding is the issue. Otherwise we would love to set up programs for those uh, people who do not have HIV also and are injecting on the streets. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. So, yeah, no, thank you. That's informative to know. Dr. Rich. Yeah, I just wanna follow up with that. I think uh, you know what we've learned in this country is that when we put people through a detox, you know, a, a, a short period of time to get them out of withdrawal, um, what we find is that uh, the same thing that happens when we incarcerate them, if we, if we can prevent them from using, some people can use, uh, continue using heroin while they're incarcerated. But, uh, but when we stop them, what happens is, I, I mentioned that tolerance goes up very quickly in days to weeks. When we let them out, tolerance also goes down quickly in days to weeks. So when you put someone through a detox, you're, you're, you're treating those withdrawal symptoms. And with heroin, you know, uh, those withdrawal symptoms increase day by day for about three days. And then they sort of peak and then three more days. And after a week, you're like a washed out dish rag, but you're not in, you know, acute withdrawal. But, uh, what happens is you have lost your tolerance. So if you go back to use the same dose that you used before you went into a detox or an incarceration, you're at very high risk for overdose and death. And that's what we found here, particularly as, as the more powerful opiates, uh, synthetic opiates, fentanyls and the like have come into the US, uh, detox is actually killing more people because about 90% of people are gonna relapse. So, you know, if, if you just put them through a detox. So it's kind of, it's a lot of work. It's putting people through a lot of stuff and there may be some benefits like, as you mentioned, if you can educate people about the importance of adherence to their antivirals, you know, maybe when they get, you know, if they survive relapsing, uh, they, can, uh, they can get back to, uh, uh, you know, using but also being adherent to their antivirals, that would be a positive. But um, you know, to put resources into detox is really not, not a good idea. It's not gonna work. I think what really sounds like this group should, uh, should just come out loudly and say with a uniform voice is that we need medication to treat opioid use disorder, whether that's gonna be methadone or buprenorphine, uh, the naltrexone is expensive and not as effective uh, as the other two. But um, I think, you know, in France, they pretty much flooded the market with buprenorphine. And uh, they pretty much saw no overdose death. They saw people come into, into treatment and into, uh, into care. If we look at what Portugal did, Portugal decriminalized possession of drugs. Uh, and so they stopped, you know, and, and then when they did that 21 years ago, they were the highest rate of injection drug use related HIV in all of Europe and a lot of overdose deaths, a lot of incarceration. And by just pushing that 
this is a disease, it needs treatment. And getting that into the culture, having people understand that, uh, and, and they still, if people have more than a certain amount of drug, then they're considered traffickers, they're dealers, they go to the criminal system. But it's the Ministry of Health that ad addresses the drug problem. And the results are phenomenal. They, people, they still have drug problem, but it's nothing compared to what we have in, in the US. And, um, and they don't have HIV related to injection drug use. And they have, you know, they're a poor country as well. They don't have, they can't afford buprenorphine for everybody. The methadone is cheap. So they rolled that out. I mean, methadone costs pennies a day. Uh, it's really, it can be manufactured very easily, very inexpensively. Um, and it's, you know, the programs can be done in the low threshold and in ways that are safe and effective. So I think that's probably, you know, if, if, if this body wants to, you know, have an impact on, on this population, uh, I would say, you know, don't go chasing after funds to do detox, you know, ch chase after policy to get methadone rolled out uh, and available. And, and, you know, once you see people, I mean, people, when they get into recovery, you get a lot of benefits. They stop stealing things and doing other desperate things. They stop, uh, uh, they stop doing the, the all crazy things. They stop spreading HIV to others. And they start taking their antivirals. They, it's it's kind of like, you know, watering a garden. They just grow, they thrive. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that that's that's an informative thought. What, do, um, Dr. Sharif Alisha, what are your thoughts about uh, uh, such programs or funding avail getting available um, for methadone programs in the country? Actually, unfortunately, we don't have any program supported by the government, provincial government or the federal government. And all the program, but what, what we have at present is global fund. Only global fund is uh, supporting and there's no other donor. So actually, you have to think about out of box. And you know, when, I, when you are uh, thinking about implementation of uh, interventions in people who inject drugs, there are a lot of issues which are not health issues, like they are social issues. Most of the uh, drug drug users in Pakistan injecting drug users are uh, young people and they are unemployed. And uh, you know, if they uh, they have no employment and they come back again after uh, detox program, they relapse. So program has to be very comprehensive to address all the aspects of the drug use. And uh, I think it's not only health issue, it's a social issue, and the apathy of general public is also a serious issue in the injecting drug use, users. And a uh, lot of, uh, like, we have problem in the uh, needle exchange program uh, in the country. Yes, it doesn't exist in the prisons. Although we have a uh, large population in prisons, and then a lot of people are drug users, about 40%. More than 40% and significant number of these drug users inject drugs. So there's no program there. And then uh, OST, without a OST, without rehabilitation program, uh, without NSP in the prisons, how do you see the uh, harm re reduction program? So it's a lot of challenges. So we did that in Rhode Island. We introduced I don't like the term opioid substitution therapy because a lot of people say, well, you know, you're either you're injecting heroin or now you're taking methadone, you're taking a substitute. And it's not a substitute. If you look at somebody who is the, the daily life of somebody who's injecting heroin, they are scrambling, looking for some way to find money, whether it's stealing or getting involved in the sex trade or doing something that's usually not helpful to themselves or anyone else. And then they're using a dose and they're doing using a dose three, four times a day. Um, if you look at somebody on a methadone program, they are spending 
you know, maybe one hour or less getting their dose. And then they have the other 23 hours to be a productive member of society, a member of their family. They're not running around doing all the other stuff. So it's not, it's a completely different lifestyle, which is what we want, which is what they want, which is what, you know, people, uh, like I say, it's not a good life being addicted to heroin. It is a miserable life. And so when people get onto methadone, and, and I, I don't want to oversell it. It's not the cure all. It's not, it doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't work for everybody the first time. But um, when I'm looking, you know, just from afar here, I mean, I'm looking at your epidemic, your HIV <laughs> epidemic is, is huge. And it's predominantly driven by injection drug use. And you are hamstringing, you know, the, the way to get like you, that's wonderful. You've got Global Fund, you've got antivirals, you've got people doing outreach. I mean, all this stuff is great, but you're, you're, you're hamstrung because you don't have methadone. I think that's, you know, to me, that is just glaring from a, from a global perspective. There is a big hole in what you're, you know, you're, you're fighting this battle with your hand tied behind your back. How are you possibly going to get people engaged in care? How are you possibly going to prevent them from transmitting it to their partners? How you, and so doing it, yeah, you actually, you should start people in jail, in prison on methadone and develop programs in the community to connect them to afterwards. Um, and it's not like the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the golden crescent is going to just disappear overnight. You're stuck with it. You've got a flood of heroin coming into your country and it's been there and it's going to be there. So, you know, you're not going to fix that problem in any of our lifetimes, but you, if you could convince the government to uh, release the, you know, to, to, to come out in favor of, yes, we need to give these effective treatments to people with this disease and, and, and convince the culture to say, this is an effective, you know, this is how we're going to prevent the next generation from getting HIV. Um, yeah, so, and, and methadone is, <clears throat> I should just say a word about methadone. In this country, I think we don't do it perfectly. We have methadone treatment programs which are tightly regulated by the government so that people can't take it like a regular medication. They have to actually go to the program every day. That's not feasible in a rural setting. So you'd have to develop delivery models that are safe the problem with methadone, methadone is basically an opiate. It binds on the opiate receptor, it turns it on just like any pure agonist opiate, but it has a much longer half-life. Now, if somebody doesn't know what methadone is, doesn't understand it, if they take a dose, because it's such a long half-life, it's a slow onset. So they take a dose and they don't feel it and they're expecting to feel what they feel from heroin, they're going to say, oh, I didn't get enough. I'll better take some more. And then I'll take some more. I'll take some more. And by 24 to 48 hours, they can build up too much <laughs> in their system that they overdose. Likewise, if you, somebody is taking a dose every day, <laughs> just starting, they take the first dose and then they wait to the next day. And then the next day they take the second dose, which is the same amount. Um, that day two, their body has that second dose they just took, but also has some left over from day one. Day three, they have both a big chunk of day one, the day two and the day three. So those doses, even if you're taking a level dose every day, those doses stack. And so by day four, they take the same dose and they overdose. So you have to be very careful about not taking too much. Um, and it does, it you know, and, and if you're, if you adjust the dose so it's too high, people are uh, sedated all day long, and that doesn't work. And if it's too low, people are in withdrawal and they want they continue to use. So it does take a few months to get people adjusted. Uh, you know, it, it, there are some challenges with getting it dosed properly, but but that's <laughs> uh those are those are there's there's expertise available to do that there's models in other countries where where it's been rolled out in rural populations rural areas i would say do not follow the u.s program that's just uh, that's that's we have a lot of work to do to fix it but it can be done can be done in corrections um you know in in the uh, 
Rikers Island, the jail in New York City, was the first one to roll out a methadone program, you know, de several decades ago. And and the people that worked there said, you know, they would come in in the morning, and everybody would be, you know, miserable in withdrawal, vomiting, soiling themselves, making a mess, they're just groaning. It was, and they would dose everybody with methadone, and by the afternoon. They're all up, they're mopping up the place, they're cleaning everything, everybody's fine and functioning again. And so, you know, you can sell it to correctional officials as, you know, your correctional facility is gonna run better if people aren't, because just because they're locked up doesn't mean they don't have this disease, doesn't mean they're not trying to corrupt the officers and, you know, do violence and everything else. To, so if you have 40% of your population that is desperate to get this, you know, get an opiate, and th that's a difficult prison to run. Whereas if you have them, you know, there was a correctional program out in one of the Western states, so they implemented it. And then a new sheriff came in and said, oh, we're gonna shut this down. And there was a big outcry. No, you can't shut it down. The outcry came from the correctional officers. They said, no, no, no. If you give people the methadone, they become normal, rational, reasonable people to deal with. And it's much better than if they, if they are, you know, desperate to try and get, you know, they're miserable. They're not, you know, they're not easy to work with. So, um, so anyhow, there's ways to sell methadone. There's ways to do it. And I think you need some leadership at the top, you know, work with the government officials, work, get them to understand that this, because if you don't do this, you're going to have more spread of HIV. You're going to have more injection drug use. You know, you can think of injection drug use as a contagious disease with opiates, because at least in this country, when somebody gets hooked and gets desperate, you know, what can they do? They can, if they, unless they have, you know, unless they're very wealthy and they have, you know, but even when that, even that's the case, they burn through it. But they generally <laughs> either steal, get involved in the sex trade, or uh, get involved in the distribution network. So getting involved in the distribution network is if you can convince someone else to start using this and you're their connection to getting drug, then you can have them pay you and support your habit as opposed to, you know, as opposed to you having to go out and chase all those funds. So the more people you can get to use, the easier your life becomes. And, uh, um, and, and, and like you said, these are young people. They're young people because the old people either stopped or died. Um, and uh, it's probably both. But, but so, uh, you know, like I said, 90% of people are gonna relapse. The 10%, you know, people are able to stop, <clears throat> but not everybody. Uh, but methadone will really help you quite a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, so we have been uh, strongly advocating for OST uh, for the last 10 years. There have been multiple consultative meetings with all government officials, with the Ministry of Narcotics, with ANF, and they happen every, there's a cycle, every two, three years, you know, everybody get, the other stakeholders get riled up about this and there are all these meetings. But the problem is that anti-narcotics force is not okay with opioid substitution therapy. Um, that was the main issue that was blocking it. Now, apparently they're okay with it, but again, we have nothing written, nothing on paper, and we've been hearing this for ages. WHO will say, oh yes, it is coming. We have spoken to the officials and it's coming You know, next year. It's coming in six months. Uh, so we are constantly advocating anybody who lend us an ear, we will, you know, shout about OSC because obviously that is the most uh, important uh, well, missing intervention. Well, I would, uh, I would just say that this is a group, you know, this, the, this group that's on the call now is a very influential, powerful group and that has connections in different places. So if this, if this group focuses on it, then it's not, you know, you're, you know, the, I'm sure you're perceived as some, you know, group that goes out and works with those people, you know, those people as if they're not us, you know, they're other than, you know, you're in the camp of people that, but, but we have to have people that aren't, you know, I mean, this group on the call here 
has, you know, the, the, you are powerful voices, you have powerful connections. If, if as a group, you come up and say, look, you know, this is one of the most important things we can do to address HIV spread in, in Pakistan. Um, and, you know, then you're not some advocate that is, you know, in the trenches like you are. Then this is a group of American connected Pakistani physicians that are, you know, that that are that are, you know, global in their thinking, that are enlightened, that are that understand what's going on. And right now, I mean, I'm looking at HIV spread across through injection drug use across the world, and I'm saying, wow, the people that have methadone that have you know access to this, even the poorer countries, if they can roll that out they can start turning their HIV epidemic around. And the peoples that are struggling without it uh, uh, are, you know, are really struggling. I mean, Vietnam is a great example. They rolled out methadone and it's, you know, they don't have nearly the HIV, injection drug use rate HIV that they had before. Um, so I, I think that that's, uh, and, and, you know, Russia is still struggling with it, but Ukraine did a phenomenal job with uh, mm -hmm. methadone and the, uh, a lot of former Soviet uh, countries are, are doing that. So it's not, you know, it's pretty clear. You get this, this is a, this is a powerful tool in your toolbox. Um, and so I think the more it can be not the WHO arguing with the, you know, the law enforcement types, and it's more like, the public health and medical community stands up unified saying we need this. Um, I think that, I think that's, that, that could have a big impact. Yeah. So again, the ministry of health was on board. Uh, we met yeah. with the minister. Um, he was for it, but the ministry of narcotics was the one that uh, sort of right. blocked it. Um, so I, I so somebody, you know, somebody, somebody in this on this call or in this group knows somebody who knows the minister of narcotics, and <laughs> I, I think that's how you work it. That you've got to get, you've got to make inroads because, you know, and and somebody can enlighten the minister of narcotics to say, look, you're not, you know, and 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 the Portugal model I mentioned, you know, they wanted to legalize, completely legalize, but they didn't, they decriminalized it to the point, you know, in the US here, we have a law that says you must wear seat belts when you drive. And if you look around on the roads, everybody wears a seat belt. There's a sign, click it or ticket. So if you don't put your seat belt on, you will get a ticket, but that's all you'll get. You'll get a ticket, you'll get a fine, you'll have to pay some money. Nobody's going to jail for it. So that's what Portugal did. It's not legal to use drugs, but it's not a criminal offense. And, and they've changed the culture. And they've, you know, they've worked on that steadily for 20 years. It's not like changing the law really changed everything. They have persisted in, in, in promoting this idea that this is a health problem. So here you have a huge <laughs> health problem this HIV epidemic that is a global problem and it's getting worse by the day here in Pakistan. And what's holding you back is a, a criminal justice issue, which it shouldn't be a criminal justice issue to begin with. This is a health issue. And so that's what you have, you have to get. I don't, I mean, I don't know the political system in Pakistan, but I know that political systems work based on the people that have influence. And I'm convinced that the people on this call or in this organization have a lot more influence than, um, than, uh, than you realize and, and can make that, um, you know, can make that. And I think, I think it's worth a concerted effort. I'm a little confused about the notion of, you know, syringe scarcity, because of course, in my Rhode Island experience, the scarcity of syringes was the problem that spread HIV. Um, so shutting down production and, and purchasing of syringes might actually be, you know, make them more expensive and make them be used even more. Um, so I'm not sure that's the, the way to go with that in the, in the medical setting, but it's certainly not the way to go for the people who are injecting drugs. Yeah. 
Um, you got to get more syringes out there, not less. Um, and I'm, I'm also wondering how the diabetics are faring if they don't, if they can't get syringes uh, and their costs are going up. So that's insulin. Um, the yeah. syringes that our clients use is 3 ml and 5 ml. They don't use 1 ml in Pakistan. Huh. So the huh. ban is on um, conventional 3 ml and 5 ml. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So, so well, auto disable are available, but uh, conventional are banned. <laughs> yeah. So we don't have a rehabilitation program. How do you see that? Without rehabilitation program. So, you know, we use this term uh, substitution therapy, which I didn't like because you're not, it's a very different, but we also use the term MAT, which stands for medication assisted therapy, that people need rehabilitation and that the medication, uh, that that's the therapy and that the, that the medication somehow helps that. But this is a very powerful biologic disease. And people, I mean, the desperation that people do, you know, when they have this disease, it's really changed the pathways in their brain. Um, it's like operant conditioning, like uh, Pavlov's dog. You know, every time he fed the dog, he rang the bell. Every time he fed the dog, he rang the bell. And then pretty soon he rang the bell and the dog just started salivating. So that's what's happening every time someone's going into withdrawal and getting high is they are doing operant conditioning. They're changing the pathways in their brain so that when they feel uncomfortable, their body says, you need an opiate to feel more comfortable. And that path, so you can put someone through detox, but you haven't changed the pathway in their brain so that the next time they feel uncomfortable, their body's gonna say, you need an opiate and they're gonna go get an opiate. So, so that, you know, that change in the brain is a powerful biological um, force that, that really, um, you know, behavioral interventions, uh, re, you know, rehabs, detox doesn't address, the medications address. So, it, so I don't like the term medication-assisted therapy because it implies that there's some magical therapy. We also hear, you know, politicians talk about, we need funding, we need more treatment beds. And it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. You're talking about some bed, like a magical bed. Somebody's going to lay down in it and then they're going to get up and say, I'm cured. It doesn't work that way. They're not cured. You can get them through that detox, that withdrawal, but they are going to go right back to using it. So, um, so I, I think, you know, you have limited resources in your country. I would go with the most effective one that you have. And so rather than setting up uh, detoxes and rehabs and, you know, all the things, get that methadone in place. Now, there are a lot of people that it's much more complicated than they just have opioid use disorder. They have, you know, I mentioned traumas, they have psychological issues, they have psychiatric issues, a lot of overlap with serious mental illness and, and uh, addiction. Um, but I think, you know, you can do your best with those, but I think as a as a base, if you today waved your magic wand and found, you know, you had a methadone program in the country overnight, um, and that was working well, <laughs> people were engaged in it, you would see a dramatic change. If you waved your wand instead and had a bunch, a bunch of behavioral programs at the same amount of cost, you wouldn't really see that much of a difference. I think it's just the more, you know, in a perfect world, I would want both. I would want you know, empathetic people, someplace where people could go, get started on their methadone, get educated about the disease, educated about their, get their families in, educate them how they can support them the best, roll it out. But in terms of, in terms of what's going to get, you know, the reality of what's going to be most effective, most efficient for everybody, uh, it is, it is the, I would say methadone is the, the cheapest and most efficient way to to, to really leapfrog into the next uh, stage of this. Um, um, uh, how do you address what is the, the withdrawal from, sorry. Uh, uh, how do you address the legal issues related to implementation of needle and syringe assistance program in prisons? Well, um, 
I, I think, you know, again, there are, there are challenges. I mean, I, if it's an, if it's really an exchange program, I mean, there, there have been a few, there's not a single needle exchange program in any prison in the U.S. Let me put it that way. Um, I think it would take a lot of political capital to make that happen. And it would be met with fierce resistance. So I don't even waste my time on that here in the U.S. It makes sense, you know, but it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's uh, the, 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 the heavy lift to make that happen would be uh, not worth, you know, I, what I'm focused on in the U.S. right now is getting medications for opioid use disorder into the, into the prisons and jails. And we've done that in Rhode Island and we've published that. We've made a lot of press about it. We've got a lot of traction. We've got the courts involved. We've got the, uh, we have a, an American with Disabilities Act that, um, uh, mm -hmm. that has determined that people with opioid use disorder have a disability and that to not give them methadone is a violation of their rights. And so that's been very helpful. Uh, so, you know, we've used the courts, we've used the uh, politicians and, and, and frankly, I've been doing this for, you know, almost 30 years now. Uh, and a lot has changed in the last few years because right now we have a horrible epidemic of opiate use disorder. It's horrible. We, you know, at the, I mentioned at the peak of the AIDS epidemic, we lost 50,000 Americans and I, and I lived through that. It was horrible. It was a Holocaust, but last year we lost over a hundred thousand Americans to overdose. So this is twice. If we didn't have the COVID pandemic here in Rhode Island, this would be the worst uh, in, in the U S this would be the worst epidemic in, in the country in over a hundred years, not since the 1918 flu pandemic. So this, you know, this, but, but the, the sort of silver lining of this, uh, this horrible opioid epidemic we're having, uh, which is a uniquely American uh, homemade uh, situation, um, is that a third of the people, a third of the families in the country are impacted by it. So when I want to go to the, you know, the equivalent of the, you know, the head legal officer uh, or the politicians, they've heard it. They've probably had someone in their families been impacted by this. They know it. They've, you know, young people dying, uh, you know, promising life and boom, they're gone. It's horrible. Um, so, uh, you know, the more like uh, you may not. So, so anyhow, the politicians are far more open now to change than they ever were because they're impacted by it. So uh, you don't want to have that kind of uh, uh, problem in, in Pakistan, you've got enough. Um, but, but I think uh, uh, trying to figure out how to convince the people in power in the country that this is a health problem. It's not a criminal justice problem. It's not a legal problem. And I would say for prisons and jails, get methadone in there. Then you don't need to worry about <laughs> and And, and the, th the one thing that's fortunate for you is that you don't have a cocaine problem. It doesn't sound like you have a stimulant problem. Uh, it's just opioids is the problem. So then, you know, like cocaine, me methadone doesn't work for people who have cocaine problem. And we have a lot of people who are just, you know, injecting stimulants. Um, and that's the real problem because we don't have a tool like methadone, but with opiates, you know, we have this tool methadone. It's, uh, it's great. It's life-saving. Um, it has its limitations, but I think, you know, rolling it out is, is where you need to go next. Great. Yeah. Community acceptance and legality are very important they impact the program success so i think hopefully we can try and get someone from anti-narcotic force on our next discussion um to help move forward um dr saima abbas do you have any comments as well i i saw your hand raised hi <laughs> hello everyone <laughs> congratulations this was a robust excellent much needed discussion and so um, proud of all the comments and all the participants, because this is a very frustrating illness for everyone to deal with, especially as 
infectious disease uh, physicians, we deal with a lot of uh, um, victims of addiction. So I just had a few comments um, because we've been doing FISA and myself for about two years now. Um, first of all, you know, over the two years, I've noticed that Pakistan is going through the 1990s of the United States. The only difference is that we have excellent ART. And the tragedy is that the retention in care is only 18%, so it's really not available. So a lot of um, psychosocial denial, stigma, a lot of those barriers remain the, um, you know, barriers at multiple <laughs> suggestions that we have made in these uh, webinars. Because again, just imagine the 1990s uh, existing in 2023 at this time. So that is one thing that mentally and um, psychosocially, even the physician community is trying to come to grips with admitting, first of all, that this is a problem. So that's been the first thing which I think uh, needs to be understood. <clears throat> Secondly, you know, the, um, a comment was made that people um, are afraid of dying of AIDS. So unfortunately, I don't think that will be um, that can be applicable to Pakistan. They have not seen it in the numbers that the US saw. So when you mentioned 50,000 people died, you know, COVID is more of a reality for them, dying of AIDS. So that again becomes a barrier to convince someone, hey, use this extra needle so you don't die of AIDS in 10 years. You know, so it's just one of those things we again need to be mindful of. Um, also, these homeless, extremely, as Dr. Shah mentioned, you know, dying of AIDS is something which is a luxury for them. I'm, I'm sorry for the harsh words. They are actually dying of poverty and the ability to just barely survive. And the trauma that you mentioned, Dr. Rich, it is unimaginable. Um, so I can't imagine that um, living in a third world country like Pakistan, it may start as a recreational drug use. I truly feel that there are, a, it is basically a coping mechanism. And then when the addiction takes over, I, I think it's a, it's a fairly tragic outcome. Um, a sec third point was that the retention of care is so low that the numbers of people are really not known, you know, as to how many actually died of AIDS. And that's something that I wanted to ask Naizindagi as well, that, um, you know, I. <laughs> Um, you know, there are 280 outreach workers, which I think are, are an amazing resource. But I, I would like to know what were the actual outcomes, how many people actually died of AIDS, or how many people died of an overdose, or how many people, because these are the statistics, uh, you know, which I don't know if Global Fund is asking for these numbers, but it would be an interesting uh, data to have. Um, uh, the other great point, which was uh, a truly a new one for me, Dr. Rich, was that detox actually kills. So I truly appreciate that point that, um, you know, this shotgun approach is really not going to last. And so um, the, that brings uh, us to the next point, which is even if by some magic wand, we did have opioid substitution therapy today, we actually have ART today and we cannot deliver it to the ones who need it most. So um, I think Bushra made a great point that you'll have to convince the powers by doing small consignments and clinical trials. But even when there is evidence that ART is life-saving, we cannot deliver it effectively. Just imagine 18% retention of care. So uh, any, um, any of these solutions, sometimes I feel really get lost because Pakistan struggles with an administrative gap, a huge gap where they cannot deliver the best suggestions. So I'm not trying to discourage anyone, but I do feel that any delivery model um, needs to be, you know, really, really trashed and, and held accountable for, which is, um, which is what is, uh, again, something which will take time but i truly appreciate everybody's input and um thank you very much for listening to my few comments <laughs>
Thank you so much. Now this was really great, Dr. Um, anyone else has any questions? Uh, you can please post it and I we will- I think in Q&A &A box, mostly questions were answered by Dr. Bushra and Dr. Saima. So thank you very much. I think it's 12 o'clock, it's two hours. So let's stop this. And unless if any, anyone have any comments, so I will ask uh, Malika, Dr. Sharaf, Dr. J Rich, if you guys have any concluding remarks for that. So Dr. Rich, what, any concluding remarks? Any, and we are looking forward for your uh, participation in future too. I, uh, this has been very, very interesting, an excellent discussion and, and a lot of, uh, a lot of interest. And I, I really uh, uh, appreciate and I'm honored to, to uh, have been able to present. And, and like I said at the beginning, I'm happy to continue the discussion and, uh, and reach out. I don't know, Fiza can certainly, I can, I can run, but I can't hide. Fiza can always track me down. Um, so I've, I'm happy to contribute, uh, continue to contribute in any way I can. So, You're on it. thank you so okay. much. So, Malika, any concluding remarks from you? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, it was an honor to be part of this, and um, I've learned a lot from Dr. Ridge. Thank you for that, um, and everyone else. Um, and anyone who has connections with ANF uh, and anybody who has connections with the Ministry of Narcotics, please take this up because. We have been doing this constantly and, you know, we uh, need more voices raised on this issue. So, thank you. So, Dr. Sharaf and then Bushra and then Fozia. And then thank you very much. Okay. Uh, very productive discussion and hopefully it will contribute towards uh, prevention and control of HIV AIDS in Pakistan. Inshallah. So, Bushra, any comments? Yes, uh, we need more educated people at powerful positions so that they can put in their own point of view and actually guide uh, those policy decision makers um, in making right decisions. Because at the moment, uh, there are people who, who have no insight into the kind of problems there are and how to resolve them. And uh, that's it, wrong people at the wrong place. That has to be addressed. Let's hope for the best and pray for uh, for the best. So Fazia, and thank, yes, let me thank you much. all of you. Yeah, Fazia, I know you have to leave, so I will give you a few minutes for us. Right, thank you so much. No, I think I learned a lot as well going through being the moderator. It was a learning experience. I think few things which we have learned importantly, again, um, from Dr. Rich that I was not aware that having detox centers and rehabs um, could have a you know deterrent effect rather than a beneficial one. And methadone would be the next step to go, hopefully, and we can work towards that. I think as a part of being in this committee, next um, targets, um, should be looking into the implementation of methadone programs and anti-narcotic force. And also, um, um, uh, Malika, thank you for bringing up the problem with the needles also. And I think that should be our next discussions also going forward, looking into um, what other, uh, you know, needles can we have? Because I understand that, uh, you know, the autologous, autodestructive, disabled, whatever you want to call them, are not recommended by WHO as well. And instead, like, a one ml diabetic disposable needle syringe is um, a recommendation. So we'll we'll move forward with that hopefully. And you know, as I said, our, our committee has learned a lot from this discussion. Hopefully, we'll continue those in the future. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Fazia. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Rish, Dr. Bushra, Dr. Sharaf Ali, Malika Zappa, Saima Ba. So. This is what we do actually last two years, we have been doing these webinars and we collected all those issues, recommendations, and we used to have very active actually participation from Pakistan. So we collected all of the, those points and we actually designed a built capacity program for Pakistan and we rolled it over in November. 
and Dr. Bushra Jamil is taking lead on that. And uh, in Pakistan, inshallah, that's kind of using our current, current resources and uh, asking medical colleges to adopt local ART centers so cre to create integrated uh, uh, model of uh, HIV care. And hopefully that will be on uh, means starting <coughs> And thank you very much. And this is what we use or we do. We get the different ideas, we get different suggestions, and then we talk to different agencies, medical colleges, and different uh, officials at different levels to help. And please let us know if you would like to see any specific uh, topic in future. And I think we will have another topic on this uh, substance use in future too. Thank you. One question, last question, just came to my mind with for Dr. Rich. Um, how do you cope with compassion fatigue with this population? Um, well, you know, um, one thing I didn't talk about is the the risk of developing this disease. Most people who are exposed to an opiate uh even to the point where they develop tolerance and withdrawal are not going to develop opioid use disorder so there's some people that and i mentioned people with trauma they certainly are at high risk um but uh the biggest risk that we know is genetic and uh, there are some people at at greater risk and so once you realize that you know that this is a disease that it's not a it's not a, it's not some, nobody wakes up in the morning and say, hey, what I think I wanna be for my life, I wanna be addicted to heroin, that's gonna be my occupation. Nobody wakes up with that. They fall into it. And you know, you can have <laughs> the worst genetics in the world and at risk for it, and you can have the worst uh, trauma and you know, situation that, that would put you at risk. And if you never start on that path of taking opiates, you're never gonna develop this disease. So just understanding that this isn't somebody, something somebody chose to do. They, you know, and when I look at somebody with this disease, the opioid use disorder, I, it's kind of like looking at a Down syndrome kid. You know, it doesn't matter if they're black or white or Asian, rich or poor, there's something about them that is just the same. It's the same, you know, and, and that's what this disease is. You know, people from all walks of life and all cultures and, you know, they get this disease, but, but there's something just so consistent about it. Uh, you know, they're different, you know, if people are wealthy, they have different ways of getting well. If they're poor, they have different things they do, but, but the disease itself is just so, I mean, I ask the questions and I, a lot of times I know what the answers are going to be because I've heard it a thousand times before. So, I think just <coughs> having that understanding and also realizing that most, at least in this country, most physicians are clueless. They don't understand this disease. I mean, that's why we got into such a big problem with overprescribing opioids is because the pharmaceutical company came and told us, oh no, it's fine, you can do it. They're not gonna get addicted. And we said, oh, well, if they said it's okay, you know, then, then we went ahead and followed their advice and they just wanted to make money. They didn't care about what happened to the people, but set off this horrible epidemic. Um, but if we had, you know, like we have for a hundred years, we've pushed uh, addiction off to the side. Like that's not part of what we do in medicine. Like, oh, we don't take, no, mm -hmm. you go to those methadone, those dirty methadone programs on the other side of the railroad tracks. You know, that's where you go. That's where those people go. You know, it's just, it's just, uh, so, so I think what, what keeps me from burning out, uh, compassion fatigue is that I can see just how wrong the whole situation is. It's just wrong. Wait a minute. We didn't take a, a, an oath to become a physician to help care for people who don't have this, this disease or that disease. You know, this is a disease that people have. And, and, and when we understand, and, and we kind of were that way with mental illness until we figured out that, oh, actually there are medications that there's an imbalance in people's brains, chemistry, and 
we have treatments that work for for mental illness. So mental illness is now it's you know kind of an illness that we can treat. But before that, there was you know oh you just have weak personality and weak you know you need to pull yourself up by a, by your bone bootstraps and you know carry on with your life. So I think uh, and and people are starved for somebody to just listen to them and that's and true. just treat them in a humane way. And, uh, and and so that's that's what keeps me going. Um, well, appreciate all that you do. It's not, <laughs> I'll give you that. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Arima, everyone. And here we conclude the session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.